Okay. There's a condition you've already alluded to today that I am sure everyone has heard of, and yet if you asked most people to define it, they wouldn't be able to define it. And so we're going to start with what it is, why someone might have it, what is the prevalence, are there false positives? I'm talking about none other than fibromyalgia. Yeah. Yeah. What was historically a garbage bag definition? Um, fibromyalgia is um, a condition of widespread bodily pain that it impacts people above and below the waist, the diaphragm. It's associated with um, early morning stiffness, fatigue, mental fog, uh, often you know some GI problems. It is uh, it was historically. Uh, based on American College of Rheumatology definitions, based on tender points in 11 out of 18 places, but that's been replaced by now criteria which involves multiple body sites affected and a symptom severity score. The key thing when the audience hears, well, first of all, it's fibromyalgia syndrome. And whenever the audience hears syndrome, what they should translate that to, the definition of a syndrome, is a constellation of signs and symptoms that define a disease, but we don't understand the mechanism. So fibromyalgia is a syndrome. We do not understand its mechanisms. We know that historically, it tended to affect women more than men, about 80%-ish or so women. With the newer definition, we're picking up a lot more men. Um, the cognitive aspects of it are really a problem. It's also associated, as I alluded to, with sleep disturbances. They get this weird, what we call alpha wave intrusion into their EEG, which means alpha waves are typically in light awakefulness. So when you're supposed to be in deep sleep or REM sleep, your brain is in kind of a light alert state instead. And so they're not getting a restful sleep. This is a d syndrome that's caused untold problems, particularly for women. What's the prevalence according to the current definition? I can't tell. I, I should know how many millions there, Pete. Um, that's an, that's a, I should know how many millions and I don't. What I, I can tell you just to give a frame of reference, um, chronic pain, we think there's 50 to 100 million Americans with chronic pain. That's a huge range, and it depends on the way you ask the question. Um, if you ask it more stringently, it's 50 million. If you ask it more liberally, it's 100. We know that there are about 8% of the population or a little over 20 some odd million with something called high impact chronic pain. This is a big one, and this is where I spend a lot of my research and policy work on. These are the people that have substantial restrictions to their pain in activities of daily living. These are the really challenging people. Of that 50 to 100 million, the most common chronic pain is low back pain at about 28%. Neck pain, 16%. Headaches around 16%. Societal burden of chronic pain is terrifying. It's astounding. We spend over half a trillion dollars a year in chronic pain. And the reason why, in part, it's not more appreciated is because we have parceled it out. We've broken it into different categories. You know, with heart disease, we lump it into heart disease, cardiovascular disease, even though it's all these different subcomponents. With pain, instead, we categorize it as it's either, you know, it's back pain, it's musculoskeletal pain, it's migraines, it's abdominal pain. And it gets dis diluted out, but when you put it all together, you're dealing with a half a trillion dollars. It's more than diabetes, heart disease, and cancer combined. Fibromyalgia, again, I'm escaping the prevalence. Many millions of people, huge societal burden. It is historically uh, a disease of histrionic housewives is how they were mislabeled, tragically. And we're having now a greater appreciation for what it is, um, what's affected. What we have learned is that there are brain systems that are clearly abnormal 
in the processing of pain in people with fibromyalgia. We find that for the same pressure stimulus, if you apply something like four kilograms per square centimeter, healthy people will give a range of reporting in a certain range. People with fibromyalgia, much, much higher. Here's another interest. I think this is an interesting um, pain concept to introduce and talk about it. There's something called conditioned pain modulation. In the animal world, we called it diffuse noxious inhibitory control or DNIC. CPM. Okay. Think back to when you were a kid. Your arm hurt. You walk up to your buddy. You say, hey, man, you know, and he's like, how you doing? It's like, well, my arm's kind of hurting a lot. And what would he do? Hit you. He would hit you, of course. He'd hit you in your other arm. He'd stomp on your foot. And you're like, well, the hell did but you do that? By the way, this is a boy only thing. Like, I can't imagine girls did this. But yes, it's of course, this is what little boys do. This is what little boys do. I was guilty of a lot of that. But then you'd say to your buddy, like, don't you feel better? And the truth is you did. Because pain in another area reduces the primary pain site. It's called conditioned pain modulation. We're all wired. It is a network, predominantly we think in the brainstem, involving some of this uh, periaqueductal gray, rostral ventral medullary regions. Labars first described this in the mid mid seventies in animals. So we all do it. We all have it. It's just endogenous tonic inhibitory tone that you can activate when yet cause pain in another site unless you have fibromyalgia. If you have fibromyalgia, particularly if you're a woman with fibromyalgia, you, you have impaired CPM. You don't inhibit. And so what is the management for these patients? Is this a curable syndrome or is it a syndrome that is meant to be managed like HIV? Yes and no. What do I mean? Well, one, we don't know exactly the mechanisms. There's different prevailing thoughts. Um, one thought, again, is it's a disruption in your central brain processing of pain through reasons unknown. Uh, there are some that believe it is a disease, a condition of small fiber neuropathy, because you can do punch biopsies, little, little skin biopsies here. And what they find in some subsets of people with fibromyalgia is those C fibers that there is alterations, abnormalities of the C fibers in the skin. And that is synonymous with a small fiber neuropathy that neurologists typically see. Now- But that's caused by what? Yeah, that's the thing. Is this infectious? What do people think is going on? So fibromyalgia is frequently preceded by some event, um, something traumatic. That traumatic can be a physical motor vehicle accident, but it could also be some uh, emotional or sexual abuse. It can be an infection. We frequently you know, also hear that story. So there is some insult that people will frequently identify. Uh, getting back to your question on managing this, we frequently use the same medications that we've described before, but we rely on more of those brain modulatory the drugs. The TCAs are the big. Um, another one like deloxetine, which is in the class of antidepressants, but it's a little cleaner, fewer side effects. It's a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. This is actually a drug that got FDA approval for pain. And so we go to this a lot. Uh -huh.